I'm Merle Shaw with Dealer Profit Services, and I'm delighted and excited today to have John Heyman uh, with an Italian bank joining us for our inaugural interview for the F&I Success Series. Uh, John is the SVP, is SVP at Medallion Bank, and he's also the president of the National Marine Lenders Association. John, I really appreciate you taking the time and giving us a few minutes today. My pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. So this is this has definitely been an unusual year. Um, you know, we started off the year with kind of normal, I think, expectations of a you know slightly trending up market for recreational dealers. Um, then COVID hit, and I think there was a moment of panic, and everybody thought, "Oh no, the end is coming." And then. Um, then all of a sudden, the recreational industry was just overwhelmed with business. So, I mean, I know you, you deal with a, a lot of dealers and you also have access to other lenders. Um, what did you see from January till now? What, what has been most interesting and or unusual trends that you've been seeing? You know, I, I, I think an, uh, the word would summarize the recreation industry uh, that I best seen staycation. Um, you know, we live in a society where people love to recreate, and uh, whether it's marine products or RV or power sports or 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 just um, uh, doing things that recreate, we we have a society that loves that in the United States. And uh, and due to the virus, uh, we've uh, we've found a new term called staycation, where people are. Uh, at home or staying within their state or their community and identifying and figuring out things to do as individuals and as families. And I think that the, uh, the recreation industry has benefited greatly from this term and from the, the societal uh, challenges of a virus, a pandemic that's gone worldwide. Uh, the fact that um, uh, the U U.S. is very innovative in their thoughts to get out of the house and to do some, some things that are fun and enjoyable. Um, I think they've really capitalized on the ability and the, uh, the country's ability to um, go out and enjoy the land that we live in. As you know, we have uh, open borders here from state to state and, uh, and people enjoy recreating and uh, whether it's marine products and going boating uh, or going camping, it allows them to deal with the pandemic and still have an enjoyable experience as individuals and families by, uh, by social distancing and enjoying the outdoors. So um, that term staycation encompasses a lot, but it has a vast impact on the recreation industry. It does, it does. So that, that in my mind, and some of the people I've talked to, it raises kind of an interesting uh, situation potentially, and I, I'd like your your take on this. Um, as you know, it both in the RV side and the marine side, there are a lot of first time buyers that came right. into the marketplace. Um, as things get back to some sense of normalcy, what 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 do you see happening? Um, to those first time buyers, when next year they realize they can go on a regular vacation. And, you know, most people will turn over, rotate, trade in, or get out of their, their first unit in about five years. What do you think five years from now looks like with this massive amount of inventory that went out to first time buyers? You know, I, I've thought about this concept a lot. I've talked with it, uh, uh, talked about it with several individuals, and I don't know that any of us have a clear answer. I think that uh, uh, I've I've been a regular boater and camper for years, and have always enjoyed that. Uh, I'm probably not too uh, different than anybody else, but I think if people are willing to take the time and make the time and effort to enjoy boating and camping that they will continue to do so. Um, it's not an over, overly expensive sport. Uh, you know, as people travel to outside the country, go on vacations, go on cruises, which has been prohibited 
uh, a lot uh, in the last uh, six months, uh, they'll realize that, hey, there's just as great opportunities to spend that disposable income of recreation by going camping or going boating or going fishing or, or riding, uh, taking and trailering their UTVs and going out and, and riding. So I think it's expanded. Um, I want to be optimistic about it. I think it's expanded people's understanding of things that they can do with their disposable income to recreate. Uh, granted, I do think that there's going to be some people that say, gosh, we bought this boat. We, we used it a lot in, the, in 2020, but we only used it uh, five times in 2021 and three times in 2022. And, you know, I think we're going to sell it. And, and certainly that, that's a consideration that dealers, that manufacturers need to be aware of. But I'm, I'm optimistic that um, people will recognize the, the, the value that um, uh, these recreation products can bring in their, their family associations, in their uh, relationships with their spouse or, or their companion or whoever they're with. And, and there's a lot of fun things and a lot of experiences they can enjoy uh, I live in one of the best states in the country for outdoor activities and national parks in Utah. And I have to tell you that uh, being a resident of Utah for the last 40 years, and I still haven't visited all the places I'd like to visit. And so from that standpoint, I, I think that um, if people have a good experience at a dealership and are supported well in the service department and with parts and the products last for them, they're going to stay uh, pretty true to these uh, outdoor products and, uh, and hopefully not only be first-time buyers, but repetitive buyers and borrowers uh, going forward as they realize the value of um, you know, RV products, RV and marine products. That would be my hope. There's always a glass is half full that, oh, we're going to see in two years, we're going to see all this used inventory on the market. Um, I, I would like to think differently and think that people are going to, see the value of uh, boating and, and camping and uh, stay with it. And, and this pandemic has brought a whole new opportunity for people to uh, be engaged in the uh, outdoor industry. Well, let, let's, hope, let's hope you're right. Um, it'll be a different, it'll it would certainly be a different space if all of a sudden we see a lot of used inventory come rolling in. That would have major repercussions for manufacturers and for dealers and uh, it could. You know, I frankly, I think uh, 2021 may be a little, certainly could be a little slower than this was last year. You know, I think that anybody that's ever wanted an RV or a boat probably went out and bought it this last year. So there, the, uh, the sales may be off a little next year, but the dealers have learned a lot about uh, promoting and marketing. And, uh, you know, people next door are going to see that I've got a trailer and they're going to want to go camping. So I think it's just expanded the opportunity for the manufacturers and for dealers to continue to engage people in our society in outdoor recreation and the benefits and values that it brings. So I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, this has been an expansion and will continue to allow people to expand so neighbors can go fishing or boating together or go camping together. I think it's a good thing. Sure. Well, I do know that folks like the Marine Retail Association are actually putting a lot of energy into trying to ensure that these first time voters are getting the best possible experience. There's a, there's a lot of focus going into that right now. And if, that, if that's effective, then, then I mean, I, I do think and, and other dealers that I've talked to have shared your concern that next year could be a little slow just because so many buyers got sucked out of the market in 2020. Right. Um, and so that may be a little slow, but, uh, but yeah, we're hoping, we're hoping that the MRAA and those folks, the RV Dealers Association are effective at ensuring the best, the best experience for these first time buyers and they stick in the market for a long, long time. I'm excited that both of my neighbors want to go camping because I have a trailer and they see me going. <laughs> so that's how I look at it. Yeah, there you go. So to shift topics just a little bit, um, with the with the COVID marketplace, as it were, have you observed or heard of different behaviors among the lenders um, towards towards getting loans for you know 
for the first time and return buyers. And you know, do you think that that the lending the lending criteria, the approval criteria, have changed as a result of this this COVID marketplace? I, I do. I think uh, earlier in the year there was some tightening that went on amongst most of the lenders, uh, non-prime, subprime, prime lenders. Um, as you, as you may or may not know, the regulatory environment that supervises the lenders, whether it was the FDIC or OCC or state, they were all very, very aggressive about making sure that lenders uh, treated existing borrowers and new borrowers for that matter with, um, with uh, equality and more importantly, were very considerate of existing loans. Uh, they, they pushed pretty hard to have lenders offer deferred payments if people were affected in their job by, uh, by the virus. Um, I know that Medallion Bank has been very aggressive about deferring payments up to 90 days. And, uh, and so far we have seen uh, a, a positive response that, uh, that lenders have, or that borrowers have stay engaged with their payments. We're very, very um, grateful for that. But I know that um, there are many banks that uh, put out a lot of deferred payments and are, are still hopeful that, um, that there's a good response from their existing borrowers. Um, I know that there was a lot of tightening going on in the way of uh, uh, underwriting criteria. Certainly it has affected uh, probably the more subprime or non-prime borrowers uh, or applicants, but for the most part, um, lending has been readily available. I don't know of any lenders that have gotten out of the market uh, that I'm aware of uh, that have uh, financed recreation vehicles. So unlike the last recession where, you know, we lost a third of the lenders, 30, 33 to 50% of the lenders, I have not seen that due to the virus. I have seen some tightening due to the unknown concerns, the credit risks. Uh, we may see more of that depending on how the, uh, the economy reacts to the election. Um, you know, higher taxes are always a problem. Um, you know, it, there's just a lot of factors that come into play. There still may be some um, additional repercussions due to the virus and, and uh, a slow job market return. Uh, all of those things have an impact on lending criteria and banks and how they evaluate the markets. But uh, overall, uh, if we can find a vaccine for this virus and if, if um, we get an administration that uh, proves to be pro-business, I think that will bode well for the recreation industry and for lenders in general. Well, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I know that, you know, there has been, we've observed some definite tightening um, and, and, and some additional caution. Um, and, you know, the first part of the year, well, the second quarter of the year, I actually had some lenders say the words, you know, given the unemployment situation, because of everything that's going on, it's, it's really hard to know, even if we verify employment today, that doesn't really tell us about employment tomorrow, which made it kind of a spooky environment to be living right. in. Um, right. and, and, and so we saw that. We definitely saw that. I'm not hearing that near as much now, and hopefully you're not either. Right. No, no, things are definitely... These were comments that were made in March, April, and maybe May, but I think that's uh, I think that's uh, drastically subsided, and uh, lenders are I don't know that they've um, loosened up their criteria, but they're certainly not as concerned in my in my understanding as they were in the the second quarter of this year. Well, it it, it appears that way. Um, now we've also observed, just interestingly, it feels like people who may be coming into the market now have somewhat on average better a better credit profile than the rush that happened in that March April time frame so I don't know if maybe maybe a lot of the folks tried to get in and got declined and that's kind of now we're back to the kind of normal marketplace um, I, I have heard that too I have heard uh... I've heard several things. I've heard that there's a lot of subprime people that were trying to get uh, uh, loans, you know, in the in the second quarter. Uh, I haven't heard that as much uh, going into the third quarter, certainly. And uh, but at the same time, uh, 
you know, those people were just looking for opportunities to go out and, and, and to recreate and, and they had some disposable income, but, um, but certainly, uh, uh, you know, it's no different for somebody that's uh, got a 610 FICO score compared to somebody that's got an 810. They too want to have family experience and they want to participate in recreation. So, you know, if you look at it from that standpoint, it's just a matter of evaluating risk and, and, um, and compensating for it through, through uh, underwriting and through rates. But uh, they deserve the same type of recreation experience as a, uh, I deserve the same time, type of experience with a 610 FICO score as you do with an 810. Right, right, right. So from that standpoint, though, I think overall that will balance out, I think, as, uh, as the job market continues to come back as it's been doing. And as uh, things settle down a little with the virus, with the vaccine, hopefully in the next month or three or four, and um, as we get the uh, political infighting uh, done and over with, that will certainly uh, help add some stability to the markets and to people's confidence. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. So um, this, is, this is your chance to give a piece of advice to, um, to dealers out there. Uh, if, if, if you could give um, a piece or two of advice for what you see as the most common mistake dealers made when they're trying to get their customers approved at lenders, um, and especially those customers who may not have pristine credit, is there a, a, common, a common thing that dealers could really work to improve? Yeah, I, I would uh, list two or three minor things. Uh, first of all, make sure that you have a, a cadre or a, a, a variety of lenders that allow you to finance from the, the worst uh, candidate to the best. You want to have multiple options. I would say that you want to make sure and, and sell and get the person in the right unit to begin with. Um, if somebody uh, qualifies for a $50,000 boat loan, you shouldn't be trying to sell them a $200,000 boat. You know, the salesperson, along with the sales manager, along with the finance manager, should all be on the same page. And the salespeople should understand what their, their customer is looking for and what they're going to qualify for. There's nothing worse than getting a customer sold on a $200,000 boat. And when they get in the finance office, they find out they only qualify for $50,000. They're being told multiple times, yeah, things are going well. And then all of a sudden they slam the door on them and they say, well, we don't want a 17 foot runabout. We wanted this 25 foot cruiser. So um, one thing is get the customer in the right unit up front, even in the sales. Uh, second, make sure you have a good cadre of lenders that can facilitate prime, non-prime and near prime and subprime loans. And then third and foremost is, um, man, make sure they just have a very positive experience. And, um, and on the F&I department, um, you know, that person that's buying that $50,000 boat wants to be treated and is just as important as the person that's buying a $500,000 boat. Uh, don't let their application sit. Don't let them uh, be delayed a week or two because you're so busy with other loans. Um, even though you're going to make more money, you have to do the work and make people feel like they're special and that they're having a good experience in your dealership, even though they, the, the F&I manager isn't making as much on their loan as the, what he is on someone else. So uh, in other words, don't be lazy. You know, work hard for all of your customers and all of your loans. Right, right, that's good. Subprime, prime, as you know, takes a little bit more work. <laughs> There's more documentation. There's more coaching the customer to understand why they're getting a 1795 rate versus a 795 or less. And, and that takes a little bit more time and effort. But uh, those types of experiences for customers will keep them coming back to the dealership for years if they have a positive experience and know that they're being helped not only with their boat, but reestablishing their credit. Now, that's, that's great advice. And, and the, your comment about your comments, the two comments, make sure that you've got the right unit for the customer and then making sure that no matter what they're buying, they get the same treatment, the same positive experience. I think those are absolutely keys to, to successful F&I. 
Um, that was kind of a long answer to your question, but I think there's three or four things that can bring value to a, a closing and bring, bring honor to a dealership. And those, those three or four things would uh, do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been, been really helpful. Hopefully by next year, we're going to start seeing the return of some of the live, the live events for, for dealers. Go back to um, Dealer Week being live, which is virtual this year, and the Elevate Summit being live, which is virtual this year. And it remains to be seen, I guess, I don't know if you've heard anything about the boat shows, because we're coming up, you know, we're only about a quarter away from boat show season kicking off. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. I'm glad that the Fort Lauderdale show is still going to be a live show. Um, I, I will tell you, as much as the uh, technology industry would like to have the recreation industry be all virtual, uh, I don't see that happening, at least in the next decade. People love to go to boat shows. They love to go to RV shows. They like kicking tires. They like seeing the product. They like talking to uh, industry experts and professionals. I mean, all of that adds to the ambiance of this product and these programs in this industry. And so I think it's critical that, uh, that these shows and uh, this industry continue to be a face-to-face -face, uh, where technology can be included. I think it's vital. But, uh, and important because the, the, the rising generations are far more technologically minded, but uh, there's nothing more enjoyable than taking your family to a boat or RV show and walking around and through multiple units and getting to know dealership personnel and salespeople and understanding the product. And uh, that, that promotes a lot of sales and a lot of fun and certainly an enjoyable afternoon for um, individuals and families to go and do. And do. No, I agree. I mean, I do believe that there's been some technology changes and improvements that have been kind of forced on us all. Um, and some of the, the virtual, the online retailing changes have, are, are for the better and they'll improve the experience. But there's a level at which this in-person experience is it's still part of, part of the nature of the industry. Um, it is, it is. You know, people can shop all they want online for a boat or a trailer and look at that, but they still want to go look at it. They still want to walk around it. They still want to get in it. And they still want to talk to a knowledgeable salesperson that can help uh, close that sale and that uh, purchase in their mind. It's, these are big ticket purchases and people want to, um, want to be knowledgeable and uh, want to know how to use the product. Right, right. So I'm, uh, I'm optimistic, this is a great industry. Nothing better than financing fun, we call it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we love to participate with dealers and with customers in, uh, in positive and, and fun experiences through financing their products, their recreation products. Not only myself, but the National Marine Lenders loves the involvement, um, um, including Medallion Bank. So both entities are very much in favor of promoting the recreation industry. Uh, certainly the Marine Lenders uh, do everything they can to facilitate networking and information and communication to industry principals and, and those involved with the marine lenders and, and marine industry. And they do a good job, by the way. And I, Thank you. I, thanks <laughs> thanks to their profit services for their involvement in the industry and, and the good that you do with your dealers and uh, promoting all sorts of compliance and uh, educating. You do a great job in service in educating uh, uh, this industry with uh, all of the legislative <laughs> and other stuff that goes on. Well, this has been interesting, helpful, useful. Um, I, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes with us today and sharing your expertise. Thanks very much for being here. It's a pleasure, Merle. Thank you for your time and for the partnership we share. Absolutely. Absolutely.